Good afternoon, good morning, good evening, depending on where you are sitting. Excited to welcome you to such an international event. My name is Marti Jimenez Nausbach. I'm the head of research at the Ostrom Institute. And today we are really excited to host our very first and special Eleanor Ostrom Day. In 2009, our beloved Lynn won the Nobel Prize in Economic Sciences for her contributions to the governance of shared resources. And Ostrom's work showed the value of actually building multinational, multidisciplinary and comparative research, bridging the social and natural sciences on one hand and the complexity of institutions and governance systems on the other. Her ideas on polycentric governance and shared collective action have played out around the world, from the main lobster fisheries to ancient waterways in Valencia to taxi cabs in Nairobi. Today, we'll be joined by some of the most prominent scholars from universities, research groups, and think tanks across borders to discuss her contributions to today's most pressing challenges, including climate change, the housing crisis, urban governance, or the COVID pandemic, among other topics. Lin disrupted many assumptions about people's ability to cooperate and solve problems without supervision. And she told us that given the right conditions and the space and time to develop trusting relationships, communities can actually establish their own systems and rules. Her work demonstrated that people's motivation and ability to cooperate, to participate, and to sustainably control their own resources are far greater than it's usually assumed. In the aftermath of the COVID pandemic, in times of deepening polarization, institutional distrust, and democratic decline, we believe Ostrom's lessons set out an innovative and inspiring vision for building back better. Her pioneering work offers valuable insights on how we can deploy local contextual knowledge from both communities and markets to build more robust, legitimate, and meaningful adaptations suited to the challenges in each place, context, and reality. But what does Lean's analysis on emerging institutional arrangements teach us on people talking and solving real problems together? What would have been an Ostromian approach to the COVID response and recovery? Can the Ostrom design principles be applied to rethinking the governance of cities and the management of the resources? To delve into some of these questions, today we are joined by an exceptional lineup of scholars from universities, research centers, and think tanks around the globe. I'd want to thank all of you for joining us today and invite you to actively participate in the next few hours, raising questions on our chat box below in the questions and answers tab, or also sharing your comments on Twitter using the hashtag AustronDay, or simply by unmuting yourself and speaking up in the Q&A rounds. I'd also like to take the opportunity to thank our partners and collaborators. So we're really happy to be able to gather such a broad, diverse and international cohort of speakers. Um, so a huge thanks to the Ostrom workshop at Indiana University, the Mercatus Center at George Mason University, the Center for the Study of Governance and Society at King's College in London, Universidad Francisco Marroquín in Guatemala and Spain, the Ratio Institute in Sweden, and our friends from, from New Local in the UK. So thanks to, to all of you for joining us today. So after these welcoming words, let me just move on to our first dialogue. Today we are delighted to be joined by what for us are two intellectual heroes, heroes of the, of the public choice uh, scene, heroes of institutional economics and economic history, but mostly and most importantly, I would say, heroes of what we call sweet talk and civic engagement. So today we have the pleasure to have with us Professor Georgi McCluskey, Distinguished Professor Emerita of Economics, History, English and Communication at the University of Illinois at Chicago. So she was trained at Harvard and she has written 24 books on over 400 academic and popular articles on economic history, rhetoric, philosophy, liberalism, feminism, ethics, among other topics. So we were very fortunate to have Deirdre with us three years ago in, in Barcelona and it's a real pleasure to have her back with us today. Thanks a lot and, and welcome Deirdre. And joining us today, we also have Professor Peter Botke, Professor of Economics and Philosophy at George Mason University, Director of the Hayek Program at, at Mercatus Center. And Peter is not only known for his brilliant work on political economy, history of economic thought and institutions, but also for his commitment with what I would say an open, richer and more vigorous public debate. So we are also really happy 
to have him with us uh, today. Thanks a lot, Peter. Thank you. So taking advantage of, of the knowledge of our speakers on, on the figure of Eleanor Ostrom and also the passion for rhetoric and, and recovering the notion of the knowledge commons crafted by Lynn, the idea is now to open up a discussion, a dialogue on the Bloomington School, its main ideas, and some of their valuable contributions to today's challenges. So I will hand it over to, to Pete to open the dialogue with some of the main themes of the Bloomington Research Program, and more specifically, the concept of, of polycentricity. So uh, sure. Pete, the, the virtual floor is yours. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Marty, and I really appreciate this opportunity. I'll, I'll try to uh, keep this uh, relatively brief. I just, I'm going to make three sub points. Uh, the first one is that the Ostrom Research Program is unusual in the sense that it takes as its uh, motivation the idea of, of a social science that's fitting for a democratic self-governing society. This is in juxtaposition to a social science that's fit for social control. And, um, and so their approach, uh, like Jim Buchanan's approach, uh, was one that sought to get beyond the utilitarian engineering elitist mindset, which dominated 20th century uh, thinking in the social sciences. One of the implications of this is that you force the, 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 the perspective to be seen like a citizen rather than seen like a state. There's not this synoptic view. There instead is, is, is going to be this uh, viewing as the citizen. And uh, that leads to a democratic view of public administration rather than a bureaucratic view of public administration. And uh, just to highlight some of the points that you made, Marty, is that they also, uh, you know, this led to their studies on municipalities and local provision of public goods, uh, which besides the, the, before the work that Lynn did on the commons, she did a lot of work on police, on roads, on education, and, and all these other things at the local level, starting, of course, with water conservation, uh, you know, and the management of water uh, supply out in LA County. So it's that local public goods, uh, notion and this builds on the work of her husband Vincent, which I think shouldn't be forgotten in, in these ideas and the notion from the intellectual crisis of public administration, um, which led to their their joint project of trying to have a new science of association. Um, the, the the some of the implications of their perspective, this seem like a citizen, is that you put priority in your theories on the clever and creative actors in the model rather than the theorists of the model. So you're giving priority to those, those individuals there. That forces you to be bottom up rather than top down uh, in your approach. And that focuses then on things that, that Lynn emphasized, like the difference between rules and form and rules and use, or the diversity of institutions and distinguishing between their form that they take and the function that they serve. Um, and, and this, uh, you know, is a very, very important part. And as you mentioned, uh, it leads to a multiple methods methodology approach, uh, because Lynn was always looking for intellectual gains from trade with a variety of, of people. Her last book is called Working Together, which is about this multiple methods methodology. But in that, she herself gave a lot of priority to field work and case studies, detailed case studies, which allow us to get at this. The last point that I'll make also relates to a point that you raised, which is about complexity of the social world. So again, Lynn is developing a theory of a complex theory of society rather than a simple theory of society. It's one of the reasons why you can have social science as social control is because the world is more complex than that model would imply. And to highlight this, she emphasized a couple of things. One of the main ones is beyond dichotomizations. So she didn't like simple dichotomizations, private collective property, right? So again, if you think back to what I was saying before about different diversity and in institutional form, but what is the function that's being served? She saw a lot of times where people could have a variety of the institutional form, but yet it derives out her design principles, quote unquote, probably mislabeled, because she's not designing them, she's inferring them from the cases. Uh, but uh, those were 
uh, you know, she wants to get us to think about how it is people come up with a variety of different rules and how they communicate them, the meaning that they have, all of that. Uh, so beyond dichotomization, this leads to polycentrism, the notion that there's many different governments uh, and governance structures. Uh, you alluded to the covenants without a sword. She was very much wanting us to understand there's covenants with and without a sword, and they have various different uh, characteristics associated with it. And the last three things I'll just say and then, and then turn it to Deirdre um, is that uh, contestation is a theme throughout all of their work, both Vincent's work and Lynn's work. And so it's great because in the dedication to governing the commons, her most cited work, she says it to Vincent for his love and contestation. And if you look at the movie that Barbara Allen did and the first interview, uh, Lynn, she chuckles in her affectious way. And she says one of the first things that they learned was that human beings are quarrelsome. They're always, they're always like fighting and have conflicts. And the key issue for her was, can they find a way through talk, through ways to agree to live together, to minimize, not eliminate, but minimize the quarrelsome nature. And she had the kind of economist counterintuitive argument that contestation can lead to cooperation rather than cooperation, meaning the absence of competition. So she was always looking for ways to in, expand contestation because it's in contestation that community and co-production get developed and, 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 and you know, polycentric order emerges out of that, this, this multiplicity of, of uh, governance. So the last thing I'll say, and then I'll turn it to, to Deirdre, is that, uh, again, like Deirdre's own work, uh, Lynn put an emphasis on people, ordinary people, not extraordinary people, but ordinary people. And ordinary people can do extraordinary things if just, just given the elbow room to do that. And so a large part, it, it might, one of my favorite passages in Governing the Commons is her critique of the prisoner's dilemma model. Because yeah. what she talks about is that the problem with the prisoner's dilemma is that the prisoners are prisoners. <laughs> they, yeah. they don't have the ability to talk their way out of the conflict. They just have to be given orders and follow the orders. And so yeah. she wants to, in fact, see people be empowered to be able to, 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 and ordinary people can do these extraordinary things if they're just given the elbow room to figure out how to overcome the conflicts that are part of human existence. So with that, thank you very much for doing this. And Deirdre, I turn it over to you. Well, thank you, Pete. You know, I'm not gonna match Pete's um, rich scholarship. And that's uh, one thing I, so much admire about him is like uh, like Ostrom herself, his openness to other ideas. He, you know, he's an Austrian economist by origin, but and I'm a um, Samuelsonian economist by origin, but he and I are able to um, talk to each other fruitfully. Um, it, it, and it, it's the skill of, of personal style, as Ostrom said, if you're just meeting about the aquifer under Los Angeles and shouting at each other, or trying to strong arm each other, or trying to get your way regardless, you're not gonna solve this uh, problem. And I, 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 I think to, to so, so I, I, I very much agree with that. I think that economics is a field to speak of what um, P, uh, concern Pete and I share should be more humanomics in the style of the blessed Adam Smith. I, as, as a Christian, I always cross myself when I, I mention Smith um, and, and in the style of Eleanor Ostrom. And, and and her husband, um, but I didn't know her. I, I didn't know that people called her Lynn. I always called her, I, I called her by her last name because I have never met, met, met her. 
But I remember when I first read Governing the, the, the Commons, I was, I was startled <laughs> that a book about economics, who was the game theorist who was her uh, co-author on that? I, I forget his name. He was at Indiana. Um, he was a very smart economist, but she got, she, so to speak, got out of the prisoner's dilemma herself. Instead, <laughs> instead of having to say, well, non-cooperative game theory is all there is to humans. Humans are silent vending machines, which is the underlying Samuelsonian assumption. Um, uh, speechless sociopaths who don't know how to talk and don't know how to cooperate in scholarship or anything else. Um, this is a, you know, I, I hesitate to say unrealistic because I, I don't think that by itself is a decisive argument, but it's, it's, it's certainly incomplete and, and a lot of fruit is to be plucked by acknowledging that human actors, to speak in Austrian terms, are humans. Um, and and uh, there, if, if, if there's any part of the economic intellectual world that I would think would be um, able to move economics to what I call, I and Bart, Bart Wilson call, humanomics, it would be the Austrians. But, and here I want to get sharp and more like Deirdre, um, which irritates so many people. And to point out that a lot of the Austrians think of themselves as neo-institutionalists. And Pete wants to, uh, uh, and I, I, it's an honorable, um, Ostrom-like goal to bring Ostrom-type um, conversational talk, uh, um, uh, uh, um, that is this idea that people are not just non-cooperative game people, they're also cooperative game people. Um, he wants to bring it together with uh, new institutionalism. And I would claim that, that that synergy, that attempt, that, that merger, let's put it in, in corporate terms, like a lot of mergers in corporations, is a clash of cultures and doesn't work very well. I, I suppose it's not impossible, but I, 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 I think it's, um, I think the problem is that my old friend, Doug Norris, most a wonderful man um, and, and and Barry Weingast is a some sort of academic saint he's a very nice man um, and then Darren Asha, Ashamoglu and Jim Robinson who are not so nice um, uh, all of them are statists and in the case of Doug North, in case of Doug North, it's kind of contrary to his opinions. He was a Marxist as a, as a young man, as I was too, but he got over it. Um, and, uh, and that's the contrast that I think Ostrom's approach highlights. Should we be thinking and, and um, Pete mentioned this. Should we be thinking of um, uh, 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 the the, uh, the Comtean model of social science from the early nineteenth century, uh, savoir pour pouvoir, to know in order to exercise power from the top down, <clears throat> or should we be thinking of this? The way another uh, 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 Becker, the sociologist Howard Becker, not uh, Gary Becker thought, how, how he talks about worlds, 
in which Ostrom style people negotiate with each other and talk to each other a lot. I mean, Vernon Smith, of course, has shown for, and, and uh, Bart and, and his other colleagues show this again and again, have shown that if you let people talk in a framework of, say, the prisoner's dilemma or just a, a simulated market, they converge on equilibrium much faster than Arrow, De Bru type thinking would suggest. Um, and, that, and that shows the it shows empirically, and they've shown it over and over and over again. This is not um, a uh, this is a very robust scientific result. Talk doesn't just matter. Talk can change the institutions, and there is where Pete and I have a lot of a lot of talk to do with each other to straighten this out. Yeah, institutions matter. I mean, if you, if uh, Donald Trump has his way and gets reelected, I really fear for the future of our, our country, of the United States and the world, therefore, uh, precisely because he'll, he'll go on in his, his wrecking of institutions, one after another. And institutions matter. The institutions of, institution of slavery in my country or in, 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 in Brazil, you know, had, a, had, had effects at the time, that's for sure, and have, has had continuing effects. But the, but, but, but the institutions don't work. And here's my point and I, that I'm gonna end on. And I think Lynn, as I'm gonna call her from now on, would have agreed and I hope she's lo looking down on us and uh, approving of our co conversation today. The institutions don't work unless the people in them believe in them, cherish them, love them. The mafia wouldn't work if it didn't have the ethical commitment to omerta. The Supreme Court wouldn't work unless it had a commitment, sometimes not entirely followed, to the rule of law and precedent. The United States Congress doesn't work right now because there's not an ethical agreement um, to found their, 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 their discussions. That's one point. The other point is, of course, that this talk, this Ostronomite talk, can change the institution. We, you know, they're proposing in baseball to put the, the pitcher's mound a little bit further away. That'll change the institutions. But it's out of talk about the astounding number of, uh, uh, of strikeouts that, um, that caused this, this uh, this consideration of changing institutions. And, he, and here, here's my favorite example, language itself, the very medium in which we're uh, conversing. Um, language, I don't need to urge Pete to believe this because he does, is a spontaneous order. And there's practically nothing about it which is institutional in the sense that Ashimoglu or North would understand. It, yes, there are rules of language, that's for sure, but they're not, they're not, um, well, they're not the sword. Fa famously, Hobbes said, and Barry Weingast agrees, and I wish he wouldn't, that, that, that covenants have no force unless they're enforced by the state. And that, I believe, is wrong. I think our agreement here in this discussion to be uh, uh, courteous and open towards each other enacts Ostrom in the very conversation we're having about Ostrom. And that's commonplace in human society. It's not rare at all. And, you know, it's interesting to me to hear these stories about Lynn. 
she obviously viewed marriage as the model of uh, human society. And that's, that's spot on. <laughs> Having been married for 30 years to the lo love of my life, I know very well that's what marriage is. It's an ongoing conversation, a uh, negotiation. It's not really rule bound in the sense that Doug North talked about the rules of the game. So here's what I'm saying to Pete. This is my challenge to Pete. Austrian economics and Ostromite economics don't mix with new institutionalism. Um. I think according to the script, I'm supposed to now ask Deirdre some questions to elaborate uh, on this. And so I do want to pick up on this theme of talk. I should say publicly that I actually am extremely in agreement with exactly what you said. Um, I do think that there's ways to find wedges of opportunity to advance a conversation. But I agree at the end of the day, that the way in which most economists talk about institutions is unacceptable. And they don't get at issues just like, um, you know, there's a difference between thinking about institutional environments as learning environments yeah. or institutional environments as nudging environments. And That's I think once good. we take the learning environment, we have to recognize right. it's an ongoing dialogue that takes place. But I guess the question, that I would like to ask you to elaborate a little bit on is you think about Adam Smith, you think about Frank Knight, you think about Eleanor Ostrom and yourself, uh, talk is at the center of yeah. the conversation. I mean, you yeah. know, Knight might have said that the, 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 the you know, Knight, Knight's responsible for a lot of different things. And so at the same time, you might have the vending machine notion, but so at the other time he says, if a free society is to persist, or improve, people must learn uh, that problems are to be solved only through intelligent agreement through genuine free conversation, or like in his right. book, Intelligence and Democratic Action. Um, so why do you think it was so difficult for economists going back to say the, the 1980s and on to understand the full thrust of your own movement towards a rhetoric of economics? Like, and, and, and since the institutional no. idea, it, it, why is it that humanomics is so difficult to get other economists to understand well, when our was, core, sorry, when our core model is bargaining? So yeah. bargaining, shouldn't it be about sweet talk right from the beginning? That's right. And, and, but it, it, it didn't, it was hard to catch on. I'm an example of how hard it is for an economist trained in Samuelsonian economics, as I was, and um, to, to escape. And I would ask the question of you, why didn't the Austrian economist follow Lachman more into a rhetorical and conversational view? Um, I, 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 but the, I, I don't want to be just a smart aleck asking a question because you've asked me. I don't know, I, I ask them is kind of the, the answer that, that, that politicians usually give. Um, I, I, I think you and I, Pete, profoundly agree that a certain materialism, utilitarianism being an, an example of it, um, has been the kind of the, the, the glory and the curse of economics since Bentham. Yeah. Mm -hmm. and, and whereas Adam Smith, I cross myself again, Adam Smith was a humanist as yeah. well as a, as, a, as a student of entry and exit. Um, and um, we, we kind of lost it. I, I, it would be, I'd have to be a much, I'd have to be as good a history, historian of economic thought as you are to have you got any ideas, Pete? Why, why we got off on this, this materialist line, which made it so hard to hear Ostrom's message or your message or mine? Why is it? So I'll just offer something very 
quick. It, it is a history of thought reference. It's it's Axel Leyenhofit. So yeah. around 1990 ish. Uh, the HES meetings were in UBC, which is a beautiful place in Vancouver. And Leyenhoff had gave the keynote address. Yeah. And he said he tried to postulate an idea that 1949 was a pivotal year yeah. in economics because we had a choice, a faithful choice. We either go in the Samuelsonian direction or yeah. in this alternative direction. And he says, yeah. we chose Samuelson. And when we chose Samuelson, all the resources, intellectual, financial, professional, were dumped into the Samuelsonian research program. That's and it continued for the next 50 years all yeah. the way out. And he said the other research program only went a little bit out on the, out on the line because very few people. And, and he said the problem is, is that if the Samuelsonian project is a dead end, we can't yeah. jump from that point to the line on the other side because we didn't develop the research enough. So we have yeah. to go all the way back to the beginning to then develop that line out. And that's something that scientists have a really hard time, you know, wanting to do because we have made progress. You yeah. know, you, you, you know, you correctly criticize a lot of the progress as cargo cult science, sure. that gets sure. done. but you know, how do we get that back? And I think that, you know, people, you know, like yourself and, and, and Lynn, but also Vernon and, you know, Jim Buchanan and others have, have helped us a lot, but we need more and more and more and more young people willing to do things like design case studies where yeah, they yeah. go and study the way people talk to each other and resolve yeah. conflicts. Well, you know, at an earlier meeting of the HES Society, Axel made the kind of background to that, that image you're talking about, saying the point of the history of economic thought is to make sure we know what the branch points were. Right. <laughs> so that when we find we're at a dead end as we are, I think in some ways in econometrics, for example. And by the way, it's a, I, I'm very interested in this account of 1949 as being a crucial year because all kinds of things happened around then. The, yeah. the early in the next year, Schumpeter died. <laughs> um, about that same time, um, Human Action by F von Mises was, was uh, published. Kenneth Boulding was a rising young star of economics. And yeah. Boulding is an un-Samosonian. Yeah. Uh, uh, he's, he's, he's on this, this other line. So it, it's a, it, it's, we, we have to realize that there's a branching and uh, I agree. Yeah. I mean, my, <laughs> I didn't ever know Paul Samuelson, but I, I'm fond of noting that Paul Samuelson was my mother's longtime mixed doubles tennis partner <laughs> in case you need that fact in the history of economic thought. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah. So um, there's some, uh, Marty, there's some questions, I think, that have been raised in the chat. Do you want us to try to address them or you want to read yeah, so, them? Or? Yeah, yeah. I'll, I'll do so. So thanks a lot for the, I think this was a super fascinating first dialogue. I would keep hearing you for, for hours, but yeah, as Pete was saying, we, we will need to move on to, to the questions from the Q&A. I really liked also the notion you were mentioning of, of institutions as as learning environments, which is yeah, very, pretty much too. connected to the rhetorical tradition that Deirdre has also been recuperating uh, yeah. through her work and also the, the concept of, of humanomics. So I yeah. do have a question raised in the chat box. I think it's a really good one. How does economics square the cycle of Thomas Schelling's ideas with Eleanor Ostrom's ideas? Is it just that polycentricity has overtaken Schelling's theory of conflicts? So that's one question, uh, maybe, Maybe Pete, you want to take this one, but then I have another one for Deirdre, which is, uh, let me just take it. Well, why don't we, why does he first answer it? Well, yeah, um, well, why doesn't Pete first answer that one? A very interesting question. So I, I think, obviously, I'm going to tell a quick little story. When I was teaching at NYU, uh, no one in the economics department wanted to uh, uh, talk that much with Sylvia Nassar because she was doing her column in the New York Times at the time. Uh -huh. And uh, they gave her my name because I was an assistant professor. So I would go and meet with her at the coffee shop called The Violet 
uh, you know, at NYU, and we would talk about, you know, economics and everything like that. And so when Nash won the Nobel Prize, she wanted to talk to me about, you know, uh, <laughs> you know, Nash. And I said, ah, I said, that's terrible that they, they gave it to Nash. I said, they should have given it to Shelley, you know, yeah, yeah. That. and she said, I'm going to write a book on Nash. And I'm like, who's going to want to read a book about Nash? <laughs> and so when the beautiful mind came out, she sent me a, a, a little like inscribed book, you know, saying, thanks that I didn't listen to your advice or whatever. But um, <laughs> so to me, I think Shelling's an interesting case to juxtapose with, with Lynn because a derivative of Shelling is Mansur Olson, which yep. at one in one way or another is a foil for Lynn. So Lynn always right. used to start, say that we should call Mansur Olson's theory a theory of collective inaction because yeah. the dilemmas that he identifies in the, in the problem of collective action yeah. can't get resolved because precisely yeah. he's not allowing the people to talk, right? Yeah. Which is to Deirdre's point, they, they can't yeah. negotiate away, they're, they're stuck. Yeah. And so, I, you know, Schelling is a, is a uh, you know, was a brilliant theorist he sees conflict and he has these various ways, but you know, he also gives us these focal point entrepreneurs, right? Yeah. And if you think about his theory, it, and so at some level, what Lynn is identifying is aspects of who becomes these focal point entre, uh, entrepreneurs within the community that yeah, people rally point. around. And I think that that is the way in which you could see it being solved. Not so much in the, in the conflict, situation, but in the way in which a focal point entrepreneur emerges to be able to tell, uh, you know, and it, and again, remember, it's a, it's a bottom up solution. No one yeah. right meet at right. the clock in Grand Central Station. It, it right. just emerges up out of the, out of the interactions. I think but, but that's you know, a very Ostrom like point. But, 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 to, but, but it happened in economics <laughs> because yeah. just as you said, we just as, as Axel said, we focused on Paul Samuelson, and shortly thereafter, some of us focused on Milton Friedman. Yeah. And, and the other foci <laughs> were cast off to one side. So anyway. I, I, I do think Deirdre gave a fantastic reference to Boulding, because I think yeah. Boulding is, is, is in many ways the unsung hero of the 20th century, because... He is. He's yes. the second John Bates Clark medal winner, but yep. he uses his, his position to carve out an alternative research program, which didn't get followed. And you can right. see it in his review of Samuelson's foundations. Oh, yeah. So the ur text of this position is not Samuelson's principles book, but the foundations of economic analysis. Yes, and, and Holding goes right after it in this JPE review of it. It's amazing, actually. Yeah. yeah. And he says, in fact, something that is very much in Deirdre's uh, light. And I also think you can see it in, in the Ostroms, which is that the, one of the reasons why the Ostroms were uh, very, uh, her, uh, you know, heretics in the field of political science was is that they were bringing economic reasoning into yes. political science questions. Yes. And, you know, uh, Deirdre is a price theorist as well as the economic historian and, and brings that price theory always with her with humanomics. And Bolding was doing the same thing. Bolding yeah. in, this, in this review says that the, uh, the progress in economics will take place at the literary borderland between economics and sociology. And, mm -hmm. he, and, 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 and a book that he wrote following pretty close on that called The Economics of Peace, he says yes. that economics provides the skeleton but all the flesh and blood is in the other disciplines in the humanities. Absolutely. And that's humanomics. Yeah. yeah, yeah. That's humanomics, Pete. That, that's that's exact. And it's Adam Smith. That, that's what's so irritating. Yeah. It's also the founder of our discipline. Yeah. yeah. So, super interesting insight, also bridging between disciplines. So, that, there's many questions coming up, but I will pick up a last one before moving on to our next panel. So, this is a one for, for both of you. What would a public choice program that integrates this concern for virtue look like in applied policy? It seems that institutions could not work in light of incentives alone. It wouldn't work with Hume's knaves anymore, since these are not good enough. One, yeah, I, needs, yeah, one needs people who believe in those institutions. Incentives yeah. are not sufficient, so that's pretty much yeah, what, what I, they do. I, I completely agree. It's, it's the, once the World Bank said, pour capital into an economy 
and that'll take care of it. And then they, they realized that this wasn't working in helping the poor people of the world. So now they say, pour institutions into the society and that'll make it. But uh, I, I think Pete would agree that, that if, you have, if you do have Hume's names or Hobbes's War of All Against All, um, you, you can't, the, and, and Mansur Olson, someone I admired very much indeed, that's exactly right, you're, you're stuck in the prisoner's the dilemma. And he, he, look, since Machiavelli, European political theory, with the, the, um, namely philosophy, has posited male adults reasonable as the only actors in politics or the economy. And all other philosophical traditions up to that time in the ancient Mediterranean and South Asia and East Asia talked about education all the time, talked about children growing up um, uh, as what we needed to do. You get adult, not a, you, adults from children. Um, uh, Kant, for example, assumes, that, that talks never, never about education, always about this this imagined rational being. And I, I think that's a, that's a big fault that humanomics could help solve. Yeah, I can't do much better than that one. That's a, a, a very, uh, Lynn um, stressed this issue um, in a paper on co-production, um, which is a key uh, part of her. She talks about the importance of understanding the textbooks. So yeah, yeah. when kids are in high school and they're learning what civics is from yeah. their textbooks, they learn the synoptic point of view, right? Yeah, that, that it's a single state that's imposing yeah. on them and their obligations as citizens are not yeah. to actually be the creators of the society they live in, but instead to be nudged around by that's the society that they live in. And, and there, the whole Ostrom program was about how do I empower self-governing democratic citizens yes. that are capable of living a free and responsible life. And did they, did, yeah. did, did they have children? Um, that's a complicated question, but no, they okay. did not together. They did not together. Yeah. Okay. That probably is ambiguous. Uh, uh, and that is confused. Both of them were married before I and see. Vincent had children with his first wife. Lynn didn't have children with her first wife. Um, but uh, so I didn't, I didn't mean that they were running, but uh, no, so let me just clarify that. <laughs> the here. mystery of the Ostroms, yee, scary music. <laughs> no, and I do recommend to your audience to look at the Barbara Allen film. And oh, it's yeah. a PBS uh, one, and it's, it's, it's a really great uh, documentary on the, on the Ostroms. It gives a really good sense of their life uh, together and their project. So, good. Um, yeah. Definitely. I also echo Pete's words. Yeah, definitely. I mean, I think this was a super enlightening discussion and dialogue. I think we laid the ground for, for all, of the, all the panels afterwards, the many relevant concepts of the Ostromian epistemic approach to, to economics and, and humanomics, and, and also recovering uh, Deirdre's work on, on rhetoric. So I really appreciate your, your dialogue. Uh, it was super nice to, to have you today with us. And yeah, let, let's move on to, to our next panel. Thanks a lot, Deirdre. Thanks a lot, Pete. It was okay, great Deirdre. having you today. Okay. Thank you very much. Greatly appreciate it. Thank you, it. Deirdre. It's fun. It's fun. Not just fun, it's educational. Mm -hmm. I'm growing too. <laughs> Thanks a lot.